Amen. So keep your place in 1 Samuel chapter 10. We're going to be coming back there in a few minutes, but we're going to look this morning at this doctrine of eternal security in the Bible. We're going to be looking at, you know, some people will call it once saved, always saved. We're going to look at it in a little bit of a different way today. I want to look at a case study on, on King Saul, the first king of Israel. So let's look at it um, this morning and see if we can see what the Bible says. I hope you have your Bible with you. We're going to be going to a lot of Bible um, this morning. I want to show you this morning just a case study in eternal security from the Old Testament. Then I want to show you how, you know, the Bible teaches very clearly that once you are saved, you are always saved. And then I want to show you how it doesn't even make any sense. You can't even logically make sense of the idea of losing your salvation in the first place. So let's go ahead and look first at what the Bible says about our um, salvation. Look at Ephesians 2 and verse number 8. Keep a place in 1 Samuel chapter 10, and we're going to go back there. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8, we're talking about, first of all, how are we saved in the first place? Are we saved through our works? Are we saved by things that we do? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And then in verse number 9, you know, we just get this very clear statement, it is not of works in the Bible. So it's not of yourselves. You are not saved of yourselves. You are not saved of your works at all. In John chapter 3, in verse number 36, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, especially out soul winning, it is the most clear verse on salvation in my opinion. The Bible says in verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That is a very clear statement saying when you believe on the Son. So we know we're not saved by our works, we're not saved by ourselves. The question then becomes, how are we saved? How do we get saved? And the Bible says in John 3, 36, it's by believing on the Son. And by believing on the Son, you have everlasting life. That means you currently possess it. You're not getting it over time. You're not, you know, you're not earning it. It doesn't come to you after five years. It says you believe on the Son, and believe on means to trust the Son, Ephesians chapter 1. Once you trust on the Son and not on yourself, you have everlasting life. You have it. You currently possess it in that moment. It's, it's that simple, folks. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, if you would. Ephesians chapter 1. So we see that we're not saved by works. We're saved by trusting on Jesus Christ. What Jesus did for us, his death, his burial, his resurrection, paid the price for our sins. It's trusting on that, and we are saved. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13, the Bible says, in whom ye also trusted. There is that equating believe on. So it's not believing that Jesus existed. It's not believing that Jesus was perfect. It's trusting on what Jesus did, who he was, in whom he also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that ye believed. Then look what we see here. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. I love that verse in the Bible, talking about how it is God that seals you once you trust on Christ. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And look at verse 28. Look at John chapter 10 and verse number 28. If you have a red letter Bible, these words will be read. This is Jesus speaking in John chapter 10 and verse number 28. The Bible says, in verse number 28, and I give unto them eternal life. So this gift that the Ephesians chapter 2 is talking about, this gift of your salvation, not only did it have nothing to do with you, but the gift is eternal life. It is literally a gift that lasts eternally, everlasting, forever. And then I love John chapter 10 and verse 28 because it says, I give unto them eternal life as, that, as if that's not enough to explain it that way. He also says, and they shall never perish. I mean, it's pretty obvious if you have eternal life, life that never ends, it means you will never see spiritual death. You will never get that second death. But Jesus just makes sure he covers both ends. It is so clear in the Bible. They shall never perish, neither. It's almost like Jesus knew the Pentecostal movement would come along saying that someone could take away your salvation or you could lose your salvation. He says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 
In that one verse, there is three statements. I'm eternally. You cannot lose your salvation. Then in verse 29, we see another one. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. This is a very beautiful couple of verses saying that once you are saved, you are sealed, and Jesus and God holds your salvation. Amen. You don't hold it. And I'm glad I don't hold it because I would lose it, and so would you. So God is promising us here that it is eternal life and that He hangs on to it for us. Look at John 6, 37, or look at the verse of the week on the front of your bulletin. And the Father, and that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me will I in no wise cast out. So we see that the Bible is very clear with a lot of scriptures, we could keep going on this, that you are saved not by your works, it's a gift, Jesus paid it for you. Once you trust on Jesus, you're sealed, you're saved in a moment, and you cannot lose that salvation. There's nothing you could do to lose that salvation. Now let's look at a case study of King Saul, the very first king of Israel. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 10. Go back there. Let's look at Sam, er, Saul's, let's look at his, his salvation, let's look at his life, and then let's look at his death in the Bible, and let's see what this means for you know, our assurance. I mean, there's so much that as Christians we can learn from the life of King Saul. Unfortunately, it's kind of one of those lives where it's like, hey, how not to do the Christian life, how not to do this thing. But look at 1 Samuel chapter 10. So the children of Israel want a king. They want to be like everybody else around them. You know, Samuel's not happy about this. God is not happy about this. But they give, God decides to give the children of Israel a king. And this king, look at verse number 5 of 1 Samuel chapter 10. Samuel tells him to go to these prophets and something's going to happen to him. After that, thou shalt come to the hill of God. This is Samuel talking to Saul. Where there is a garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass... When thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place, with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. That's a key verse right there, that he will be turned into another man. We see, um, we see the same type of language used about salvation in the New Testament. We'll look at that in just a minute. Look at verse number 9. So Samuel is saying, this is going to happen to you. And then in verse number 9, it actually does happen. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And the, all those things that came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. So Saul, just like Romans chapter 4 and verse number 3, talking about Abraham, remember that people in the Old Testament were saved the same way that people in the New Testament were saved. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. This is Saul's moment where he believed God, and God gives him another heart. Look at John chapter 3. In verse number 3. Actually, you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'll read for you John 3.3, 3, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He's talking about people getting saved, getting um, salvation, and he's talking about you know, this spiritual rebirth that will happen when you get saved. Look at John, or you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. John 3.3 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Remember, Saul was given another heart, the Bible said. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. Look what the Bible says. It says in verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old passed away, behold, all things are become new. So Saul believes God. Saul has his moment of salvation in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now, how does it go for Saul after this? Almost immediately, Saul turns away from the Lord. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Of course, even before 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul was rebelling against the Lord. He had sacrificed um, without Samuel being there. But the big one was in 1 Samuel chapter 15, 
where Saul just rebels against the Lord. He's a saved man. Saved man and he rebels against God. Imagine that. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 1. Samuel tells you know, Saul to do something very specifically that the Lord wants done. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So Saul is given this very direct order from the Lord that he is to slay this wicked man, his army, and all his people. Everyone. This was the command that was given to Saul. Look down at verse number 19. So Saul, of course... He goes out and he sort of follows this command. He, he slays most of the people, but for the, the good sheep and then King Amalek, he keeps alive for himself. They keep the best of the spoil, and then he does not kill the king. Look at verse 19. Samuel calls him out on it. And he says, Wherefore then, wherefore then didst thou obey the voice of the Lord? This is Samuel. But didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, now it's super important right here in verse number 20. And you start to see the heart of Saul. And you start to see the rebellion of Saul against the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. So here, the prophet is saying to him, You didn't listen and you didn't do what you were supposed to do. And instead of admitting fault, Saul says, Yes, I did. He, he argues with the prophet. And have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of the Am Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, then he puts blame on the people that kept the good livestock and the good spoil. He says, but the people took of the spoil, sheep, oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. He blames the people... And then he says, oh, but it was, for, it was for the Lord. So he basically says, you know, I've done everything right, and anything that was wrong, it was the people, and even that was done for the Lord. So it was just excuse after excuse after excuse. Verse 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice, and obeying the voice of the Lord? Samuel calls him out and he says, look, the, the Lord wants your obedience, is what he wants from you. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of lambs. And then look at verse number 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. He lost the kingdom right here. Samuel tells him, because you've rebelled against the Lord, and you're stubborn, and you will not at least even admit that you were at fault. He's like, you've lost the kingdom. Look at verse number 30. Now he, he gets caught. He knows he's caught. He knows he's in trouble. And he gives a half-hearted apology in verse number 30. Then he said, Saul says, I have sinned. Yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. So he apologizes, but he apologizes just so Samuel will stay with him and the people will still follow him. Okay, so it was, it was just to regain favor. It was just to regain power that Saul even apologizes in the first place. So now Saul's rebelled against the Lord. Now turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now Saul's life is basically defined by chastisement from God. If you just read the rest of 1 Samuel, it is just nothing but God just chastising this man all the way up to the point of his death. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now, we're going to talk about this in a couple minutes, but this is when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon someone or it departs from someone. This is the equivalent in the New Testament of being filled with the Holy Ghost. And, you know... 
or not. So it's not that he's lost his salvation here, and I'll prove that to you um, in a few minutes. But look at verse 14. It says, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, meaning he was no longer filled with the Spirit. Okay? doesn't mean he's not saved in the Old Testament. You see this used all the time. And an evil spirit, where? An evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 18. So notice, every single time that you see an evil spirit come upon... Now, evil in the Old Testament, evil in the King James Bible, means hurt. When, the God, when God was going to do evil to um, a bunch of you know, people, it means he was going to punish them. He was going to hurt them. It doesn't mean that God is evil. Evil means hurt or punishment. Look at verse um, 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 18. So this evil spirit that would come upon Saul, it was from the Lord. It was punishment upon Saul. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 18. And it came to pass on the morrow that the, what? The evil spirit from God came upon Saul. And he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand, as at with other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So here, this evil spirit, this, this chastising spirit from the Lord comes upon Saul again. It's literally driving him mad. For he's trying to kill David. Go to chapter 19. Go to chapter 19. We'll see another instance of this. Look at chapter 19. Look at verse number 9. 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse number 9. The Bible says, And the what? The evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, and he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the, with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Let's look at this, this idea that, that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Turn to Psalm chapter 51. Turn to Psalm chapter 51. There's a really interesting verse where David is talking about this in Psalm chapter 51. After David sinned, David sinned, and you know he was asking God a very specific um, prayer in his humbleness, in his repentance. And look at verse number 11 of Psalm chapter 51. The Bible says, so we're looking at this, how the Spirit of the Lord could depart from Saul, and then this evil spirit from the Lord came to Saul from the Lord, remember. Look at Psalm 51 and verse 11. The Bible says, cast me not away from thy presence. This is David praying to God. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He's saying, fill me again with the Holy Spirit. But then look what he says in verse number 12. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. So he's asking for God to fill him again with the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He doesn't say, bring my salvation back to me. He says, give me the joy of my salvation and fill me again with your spirit, is what David is saying. So the Holy Spirit being upon someone again is, is, is the same in the Old Testament as, as, as being filled with the Spirit. We see that in Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament. Turn to John. Um, actually, turn to um, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. So back to Saul. He was under the chastisement of God. He's rebelling against God. Every single time this evil spirit was upon Saul, it was from the Lord. It was from the Lord. So evil being this troubling or this hurting spirit um, that, that God gave to Saul. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we, have, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't mean that we're always filled with the Holy Spirit, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's back to the Holy Spirit. So basically, Saul was saved, but he was rebelling against the Lord, and the Lord was punishing him all throughout his life. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Look, I believe that, you know, a lot of people would say that, okay, Saul lost his salvation, you know, because of all the wicked things that he did. But look, the, the fact that God sent the evil spirit to Saul actually proves the opposite. It proves that God was chastising him in his life. This is also... Um, interesting. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16 and look at verse number 23. It's also interesting that the only person that could help Saul on this earth that he was, he was against. He was trying to kill this man. Look at verse uh, number 23. The Bible says, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God 
was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. The only person that could help Saul was the man of God. The only person that could help Saul was the very person that Saul's flesh was trying to kill. That's ironic right there. He, that's why he, dis, instead, of, instead of embracing David, instead of embracing the man of God, he despised him. And he tried to kill him over and over and over. Now turn to 1 Samuel chapter 28. Finally, God has had enough of this man. God has had enough of this rebellious child. And look at 1 Samuel chapter 28. And I'll give you two proofs right here that Saul is in heaven. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse number 18. So Saul, Saul, God finally says, you're done. I've had enough of you. So God sends Samuel back. Samuel has died, but Samuel comes back to Saul and appears miraculously to Saul in verse number 18. And he says this, and he says, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Notice how God is still using this one thing that Saul, this shows you that Saul has not repented for that sin. Saul has not, you know, said he was sorry and owned that sin in his life. He brings it up that he's going to kill him for this. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Verse 19. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand. This is Samuel talking. Samuel is dead. Samuel is in heaven. Therefore, moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be where? Be with me. Amen. The Lord shall also deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So first of all, a lot of people may say, oh, well, Saul was never saved or Saul lost his salvation. But here's the thing. Nobody would say that about Jonathan. Jonathan, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, the Lord was with Jonathan. Jonathan was a great man. Jonathan was helping David. He was helping the man of God. Jonathan, nobody would argue that Jonathan was saved. But Jonathan and Saul will be in the same place. This is also more proof that Saul was saved and that he would be in heaven with Samuel. Look, God was going to kill him. God says, you're done. I'm taking you off this earth, but you're going to be with me tomorrow. And, you know, it, it, Jonathan was nothing like his father. So we see that he not only is in heaven, but he is with his sons. Jonathan is also um, with him. This is also why you need a King James Bible. Because if you don't have a King James Bible, you get into all this weird like Sheol and the grave and paradise and all this kind of weird doctrine. You've got to have a King James Bible because in the King James Bible and God's Word, there's heaven and there's hell. That's it. There's no purgatory, folks. It's not in the Bible. So go to Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2. So the story of Saul shows us two things. It shows us that God keeps his promises, number one. Once you are saved, you are always saved. Go read about Saul's life. The man was a murderer. The man rebelled against the Lord. He was the most, he was terrible, but he was saved. Look at Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2. God keeps his promises. The Bible says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Look, if God promises you eternal life, if he says, I'm going to give you a gift, and this gift is forever. It's everlasting. It had nothing to do with your works to get it. It has nothing to do with your works to keep it. It's forever. You're sealed. I hold your salvation. And then God takes it away? He's a liar. And the Bible says the only thing that God can't do is lie. God cannot lie. Turn it back to Ephesians chapter 1. So first of all, God keeps his promises. We learn that. That is demonstrated to life. Go to back to chapter 1, and this time look at verse number 5. The next thing that we see demonstrated from Saul's life, you're like, this sounds pretty good. Once I'm saved, yes, I can never lose my salvation. But guess what? Guess what? What happened to Saul should be a lesson for every single saved person out there. Look at verse number 5. The second thing we learn from Saul is this. Once you are saved, God will be fathering you. God will be parenting you. 
God will be chastising you. Look at verse number 5 of Ephesians chapter 1. Having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Turn to Galatians chapter 4. Look, once you get saved, you are adopted into God's family. Amen. Galatians chapter 4, in verse, you're like, that sounds pretty good. Look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 5. Galatians chapter 4, verse number 5. The Bible says, to redeem that, that, them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of of sons. Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Again in Galatians 3.26 it says, We are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Once you get saved, once you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, you become adopted into God's family. Now here's the problem. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. The evil, remember, where did the evil spirit come from with Saul? The evil spirit came from the Lord. Here's the problem that we're going to have as saved people in our lives. God is a good father. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 6. You will deal with, with God's chastisement in your life if you are saved. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons, as with sons. For what son is he? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a, day, a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So it, look at verse number 9. I mean, verse number 9 is basically threatening your life. <laughs> I mean, it's basically saying, look, if you rebel against God as a saved person, it could cost you your life on this earth. Look, it's not going to cost you eternal life, but it costs Saul his physical life on this earth. God sent that army against him. He saw that army coming, and he fell on his own sword. So he wouldn't be, you know, tortured by the army or whatever, but it ended his life on this earth. God ended him. This is no joke. And it says, no chastening, verse 11, for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth that peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Look, folks, the chastisement of God in your life is no joke. It is no joke. It is something that, you know, God is, God is a perfect parent. You know, we all may be parents someday, and some days we may just be like, well, you know, I just don't feel like, um, you know, I just don't feel like following through on my punishments today. Look, that never happens with God. God will chastise you unto your own good, unto, it, look, it'll yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. God wants you to be fruitful in your Christian life. He wants you to be profitable in your Christian life. And it says that he'll scourge you if you get out of that. If you rebel against him, there will be punishment in your Christian life. I gave the gospel to one guy uh, one time, and he, he got, I got this across to him so clearly that he was clearly in sin in his life at that time. I gave him the gospel. He accepted Christ. He got saved. He's like, I think you just ruined my life. And then I'm like, possibly. Because if you continue in that sin now, it's not like you're going to lose your salvation, but God's going to start beating you in your life now. And that guy just got it. He understood it. He understood. He was sitting there thinking about the things that he was into in his life. And he trusted on Christ. He's like, I think you just, and he was thinking, maybe I'm just going to keep doing these things. And he, God was going to chastise him for those things now. Look, God's not going to chastise people who are unsaved. They're going to pay in hell. They're going to pay for eternity. Job chapter 21 talks about that. But the story of Saul is not only a story of eternal security, it is a warning to us to not fall away, to not rebel against the Lord, to not get out of church. It's a warning on how bad God's chastisement can get. Saul was literally driven to what most people would agree is probably madness by the Lord because he just kept rebelling against the Lord. 
This is how, you know, and it's also a lesson on how terrible Christians can be that are just backslidden. He was basically driven insane by his rebellion to the Lord. He turned on the man of God. You ever seen that? Just turned on the only person that could help him. Turned his life into an obsession of killing him. So look, folks, this is a warning to all of us. You know, you say, oh, well, you know, eternal security, that's great. But look, unless, here, unless today is the most spiritual you have ever been, you are by definition backslidden in your life. And you are open to God's chastisement at that point. You should always be fearful of the Lord in your life. Not, not for your salvation, but just the chastisement of God on your life because he's an active father. He's not like us. There's not days where he gets lazy. He's just like, oh, I'm just going to let some things slide. God is an active father, and he's been adopted by him. He's active in your life every single day. There's no not disciplining. So that is the, that's the case study of Saul. It's more of a, you know, yeah, it proves eternal security, but it's more of a warning. If you're saved today, it's more of a warning of, of God's chastisement on your life. But let's just look at some logical arguments here. Let's do, a, let's do a thought experiment on eternal security or if we could lose our salvation. Look, it has to be eternal because it doesn't make any sense that it's not eternal. Let's just do a, a quick thought experiment. First of all, and this was one that actually, I was raised Lutheran, if, if many of you don't know that. But I was raised Lutheran, and this is actually one after I got saved, and I was still in the Lutheran church, and I was getting ready to uh, leave the Lutheran church and get into a Baptist church that preached the Bible. This is actually one of the last questions I asked my Lutheran pastor. It was this. I said, you know, if we just do a thought experiment, let's just, let's just pretend that we just didn't read all those verses in the Bible that just clearly prove eternal security. Well, let's just think about I, the idea, okay, we can trust on Jesus, and then if we fall into sin or whatever, we can lose our salvation. Okay? That would mean that you would have to be born again and again and again. And I asked my Lutheran pastor this question. I said, where in the Bible is, is, is that ever, has that ever happened to anyone? You'd think we'd see one example. Where there'd be uh, someone that was born again. They got saved, then they fell away, then they got born again, and they fell away, then they got born again. But you don't see that at all in the Bible. You'd have to be baptized again and again and again since baptism comes after salvation. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. So first of all, you have to be born again and again and again. You don't see that in the Bible. But the second one is this, in our thought experiment, and how it just doesn't make any logical sense that you could lose your salvation. In 1 John chapter 5, here's the thing. If you could lose your salvation, you could never really know if you were saved. And the Bible says that you can know. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. Look what the Bible says. It says, These things have I written unto you, that believe on, there's that salvation, the name of the Son of God. Why? It's like I, we wrote the gospel down in the Bible. God says, I gave you the word of God, that, that you that trust on my Son, that what? That ye may know that ye have eternal life. And they, believe, they may believe on the Son of God. So it's saying, it's saying like, I've written these things down so you may know that you have eternal life. Here's the thing, folks. If you can lose your salvation, you could never really know if you were saved. Why? Because here's the thing. There's no, you, you would need to know three things. There would have to be a list of sins that you could commit that would make you lose your salvation. There would have to be a list of how many times you could commit those sins. There would have to be a, li a list of, you know, some specific directions on how often you could commit specific sins. There is no list like that in the Bible. You could never know if you were saved. You could never know. You could never know what could cause you to lose it. I mean, there's no way. You know where this list comes from? If you ever talk to Ben Outsolini, you ever talk to Pentecostals especially, you know where this list comes from? Because every single person that believes they can lose their salvation, they have their own list. They have their own list of specific things that they think will cause them to lose their salvation. You know where it comes from? It comes from the false prophet pastor that is teaching them in their church. Yep. You're just making things up. One Pentecostal lady told me at the door, she said, um, I know that I'm saved and I know that I'm going to heaven as long as I don't commit more than six sins a day. And I'm like, okay. You know, I mean, first of all, I, if you're going to make something up, I mean, make it a higher number. 
I mean, six. I mean, you have no chance. Six sins. I mean, the thought of foolishness is sin. I mean, you know. Another one was a, a, a gal in my wife's homeschool group back in, in North Dakota. She was Pentecostal as well. She was convinced if she wore pajama pants, she'd go to hell. She's, she was terrified that if she wore pajama pants in her house, she was going to burn in hell forever. Uh, where, where did that come from? Look, we're all for dress standards, and we're all for ladies dressing like ladies, and men dressing like men. We're all for that. But look, it's not going to make you go to hell. I mean, she was terrified of it. It's because the man that was preaching to her was teaching these things. Her husband was teaching her. Look, if this was true, there's going to be a lot of people accidentally in hell. Think about this. There will be a lot of people accidentally in hell. I mean, to, because you're going to accidentally do something. You know, remember that time back March 4th, 1982, when you were, you know, you committed seven sins that one day? Hell. Oops. Look, that's, it doesn't make any logical sense. There's no list in the Bible about the sins that can make you lose your salvation because... You can't lose your salvation. Look, folks, it's all just works. It's all works-based salvation. Look, there's no difference in believing that you have to do good works to be saved as, to, as there is in, in doing good works to stay saved. It's the same philosophy. It's just covered up a little bit better. It's philosophically the same. Here's the third, third one in our thought experiment. How would you get resaved? Think about that for a second. If you could lose your salvation, how do you get resaved? Because you sit there and you're like, okay, I guess you have to re-believe. But you're like, well, I always believed. Just because you fell into sin doesn't mean that you stop believing. So that doesn't make any sense. But here's what people actually think, because this is the church that I used to go to that actually taught this. Turn to 1 John chapter 1 and look at verse number 9. Sinning doesn't make you not believe. So it wouldn't even make sense that you could you know, have to re-believe because you'd never stop believing. But people will just say what they'll say is that you must confess your sins. Look at 1 John chapter 1. So they take a good thing. Look, confessing your sins is good. Don't get me wrong. Confess your sins as much as you possibly can. Stay right with the Lord. Look at 1 John chapter 1. Look at verse number 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is that talk, does that say to be saved? This is simply talking about your relationship with your heavenly Father who's adopted you. There's this weird doctrine out there that, you know, you have to believe, you know, this is Protestant doctrine, basically, right here. You have to believe on Jesus, and then you just have to keep confessing your sins. It's like you have to go to church every Sunday morning, and you have to confess your sins like you're shaking an Etch-a-Sketch every single Sunday morning. You shake that Etch-a-Sketch and then you're clear. And then you sin some more and you shake it again the next Sunday and you sin some more. But my question was, and I always thought this in my mind, my question was this, what happens if I go out, I shake the Etch-a-Sketch on Sunday morning and then I have a horrible thought and then I get hit by a car before the, the next Sunday morning? I mean, how long is your Etch-a-Sketch actually clean? if we're going by this doctrine. Look, no one's going to heaven if this is the doctrine, folks. No one's going to heaven. It's not in the Bible. This is the problem. People would have no assurance of their salvation, and the only people that would have assurance with this kind of doctrine are super arrogant people that just think they're great. Turn to James chapter 4, in verse number 6. The people that think they're pretty good. You know, this is the, but guess what? That's the opposite of what it takes to actually be truly saved, is what the Bible says. Look at James chapter 4. Look at verse number 6. James chapter 4. So if you're super arrogant and you think, well, I'm good enough, you know, I confess my sins enough, I go to church enough that, you know, I'm clear. I've, I've 1 John 1, 9 enough during the week to where it's good enough. If you are arrogant enough to think that you are good enough in that sense to get yourself to heaven, look at, first, or look at James chapter 4 and verse number 6. The Bible says, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You know, it's those type of people that you'll go up to them with the gospel and they'll never accept it because they're too proud. 
They'll never accept a doctrine like the actual gospel of the Bible because they're too proud. They think they're pretty good. They think they're pretty good. Turn to Romans chapter 11. So look, it makes no sense. You can't even, you can't even logically think it through. Aside from all the clear scriptures in the Bible, you can't even logically connect the dots in your own mind. We could never be sure. There's no list of sins in the Bible because you can't lose your salvation. Once you've trusted on Jesus, you're sealed. Look at Romans chapter 11. You say, what's the big deal? I still believe Jesus died for me. I just also believe that I have to like, you know, do good works to stay saved. What's the big deal with that? Look at Romans chapter 11. Here's the big deal. The big deal is the Bible. That's the big deal. The Bible says it's one way or the other. Look at Romans 11.6. The Bible says, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You know what that means? Turn to Revelation chapter 20. You know what that means? It says, it is either one way or the other. Amen. Completely. It is either all grace, it has nothing to do with works, or it's works. And you know what? The people that believe in works, they will be judged by their works. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Romans chapter 11 and verse number 6 is saying it's one or the other. Look, we, if, you don't, if you get nothing from this church, from the preaching at this church, you should get that God is an extremist. God is not gray in any area. God is either you are with me or you are against me. It is either grace or it's work. That's it. And for the people that believe it's work, they're going to be judged by their works. So those people that think they're pretty good, they're like, I'm pretty good as long as I confess my sins. As long as I... And if you talk to those people long enough, you will realize that there's really, they really think that pretty much everybody's going to heaven if you talk to those people long enough. But look at Re Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 12. The Bible says, And I saw the dead... Small and great. This is the great white throne judgment. Stand before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened. These were the people that are taken out of hell that are standing in front of God. And the book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead who were not in the book of life, they were judged out of those things which were written in the books. You know what that is? They're judged from the law. They were judged from the Bible according to their what? Their works. You think you're pretty good? You think you're going to get to heaven by your good deeds? You're going to be judged by your works. And guess what your good deeds can't cover up? Your sins. And that's the problem that everyone is going to have. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. See, what these people do by choosing works, look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 21. Works in any way, folks. Keeping yourself saved works to get yourself saved. It's the same thing to the Lord. This is really the answer right here in Galatians 2 and verse number 21. It says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You know what frustrate means? It means to stop. It says, if you think that you're saved by your works, you're stopping God's grace. How are you saved? Through God's grace. Who wants to stop God's grace? Look, if you're not saved, you need, you need God's grace. You need God's grace to, be, to give you that gift of eternal life. And this is saying that by believing in works, you are stopping God's grace. Because if it's works, it's no grace. Romans 11. Because people that believe Jesus died for them and also believe they have to do works, they're really only, they're frustrating, they're stopping the grace of God. That's what this is saying in Galatians chapter 2. Frustrate means to stop or to prevent. They're taking, I mean, they're taking partial credit. Think of it that way. Think, think, think of building a house for somebody. I mean, just think of God for a minute. I mean, this is, a, this is a bad analogy because nothing can compare to what Jesus Christ did for our free gift of salvation. But you think, think about you build a house for somebody. You build this whole house for them. And, and you, you tell them, hey, this is your house. This is a gift from me to you. And then this person, they show up that you built the house for them and they have like a nail. And they like, and the nail isn't even needed. The house is done. And they like pound a nail in like the side of the house and they're like, yeah, we built this house together. Think about that. That's what you're doing. When you sit here and you say, oh yeah, 
you know, my works, and, and I have to keep my salvation through my works. Look, you're, you're pounding a nail into a house that's already built and taking partial credit for that house. And you know what? Galatians says you're stopping God's grace. It's not salvation. So look, God, God deserves all the credit, and he wants all the credit. And that's all he wants. All he wants is for you to trust in what he did, because he did all the work for your salvation. And that's why it's a gift. If you had to pound in one more nail, it's not a gift. It might be a good deal, but it's not a gift. So eternal security is clearly pointed out in the Bible. Anything outside of that, anything saying you can lose your salvation for any reason, it's just, it's just veiled work salvation. This was the Reformation, folks. The Catholic Church, the, this was the Reformation. The Catholic Church got so stupid. Why, you can buy your way into heaven. You can buy your relatives out of purgatory. You can buy all these things. You can buy yourself, you know, sins. You can buy... Look, the Reformation came along, and it still works. But it's just better packaged. It's prettier. But look, believing that you trust on Jesus, and then you have to live a good life and confess your sins and all these things, it's the same thing. It's just, it's just a better package. Once saved, always saved. It's clearly taught throughout the Bible, and it's very, very simple. And it's the only way the Bible makes any sense. But that doesn't mean that, you know, the chastisement of God is not going to be upon all believers. Remember that when you read about the story of King Saul. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.